Although the Hungarian language is known to be rather a difficult language with an extensive vocabulary, we do not have a word for woke yet. Uh, the reason is simple. So far, so far, we were lucky enough not having uh, to come up with one to describe our everyday reality, and, and we will obviously do everything we can to ensure that it stays in that way. But I remember uh, using the word woke, I mean the English word woke, in Hungary for, for, for the first time, in a campaign even, um, after which a lady from the audience came up to me asking what the hell I was talking about, followed by another other lady uh, telling me that she liked my speech but was unsure why I kept repeating the fashion magazine Vogue <laughs> during my remarks. There is also a theory saying that the Anglo-Saxons were immune to totalitarian ideologies in the 20th century because these ideas and rhetoric cannot be incorporated into the English language. Well, I hope we Hungarians are in the same situation with the woke. But how it started and how we had to deal with that kind of issue. The first time wokeism became the center of public discourse in Hungary was around 2020 when Hungary, along with 13 other countries, hosted the European Soccer Championship. We did realize that the practice of taking the knee before football and soccer matches was becoming more and more widespread. And, but given that we have never had slavery, this was something alien or foreign to us, but we also accepted as a cultural phenomenon, thinking it would not impact us much. Well, we were wrong. As time passed by, our Hungarian players received more and more criticisms for not taking a knee before the games. We tried to explain how out of context this is to us and how an average Hungarian, the same lady, uh, who asked me uh, what the word woke means would assume that the player kneeling on a pitch is struggling from se several kinds of health issues. You know, are they okay, my darling, or things like that. So this otherwise very cultural and context-specific practice, which according to my understanding was at the time also widely disputed in the United States, has quickly become one of the Vogue beliefs, incontestable and unquestionable. My issue and our issue was not with the phenomenon of kneeling per se. People are free to agree or disagree with its symbolism. The thing I took an issue as an example uh, with was that the way this was being imposed on us. Uh, the Participating in such gesture politics became an ultimate sign of one's morality. That was the moment when it became the element of the woke word order, what we're discussing today. And these were the first occasions when we realized that there seems to be a fundamental contradiction between the so-called woke values and the values we Hungarians, proud of our country, nation, thousand euros uh, history cherish. We Hungarians take football or soccer very seriously, but to be frank, even then we would have let it go. But the turning point came when we realized that the woke propaganda is being used against our children. As in the cautionary tale of the frog in the boiling water, we started with, they started with more neutral grounds first, and then started targeting our children, brainwashing young kids with harmful ideology, making them down in their own identity. Recently, actually, I found out the reason why the left is so busy with the issue of parenting and child rearing. Karl Popper, the intellectual mentor of George Soros, who is the father of the whole Open Society Foundation and ideology, views reproduction rights as the weapon for class struggle. The one who controls family policy and reproduction rights controls the future. That is exactly what the left is planning in Hungary and elsewhere by bringing LGBTQ and Vogue propaganda to schools. They want class struggle. 
but not appropriate classes in school. That was the point when we decided to act. Hungarian parliament passed the child protection law confirming that sexual education of children belongs to the parents and they must be protected from age appropriate content in the media and the internet. And then we decided to hold a referendum with the aim providing that we already knew that the majority of the Hungarians agrees with the government positions. We asked Hungarians four questions, whether they agree holding info events on sexual orientation in public schools without parents' uh, consent, the promotion of gender reassignment treatments to minors, the unrestricted exposure of minors to sexual explicit um, media content, and showing media content on gender-changing procedures on children. Issues that are obviously discriminated, unethical, barbarian, of course, that's what we heard from the very first moment. But the results are speaking for themselves. We had one of the highest turnout in the history of Hungary referenda with a high record percentage of no votes to all these issues. More than 92% of the Hungarians voted against uh, these issues. One would assume that this put an end on the attacks, but, but it's still uh, an everyday uh, reality. Following the start of the war in Ukraine, in the middle of an economic crisis, in the middle of the refugee crisis, two Central European countries, the countries which are taking the most efforts for those people who are fleeing from war, Poland and Hungary, still, no, still not get the financial support from uh, Brussels, just because they are uh, ideologically on a different um, side. So let's talk about the EU. What is, um, how it's, um, all these issues linked to, to uh, the European Union. Uh, first, credit where credit's due. So since its founding, the EU has had a long list of achievements. After the Second World War, it managed to contribute uh, to the consolidation of the continent, driving economic cooperation between European countries, and managed to integrate the countries of Central and Eastern Europe. However, the original purpose of the EU was to avoid hegemony of one single idea or ideology, and ensure that its equal members can work together on issues of mutual interest while respecting each other's history, culture, aiming at uh, improving the competitiveness of Europe and strengthening the continent in the process. What we see today is often the polar opposite. A few months ago, I witnessed 27 presidents and prime ministers gathering for European Council meetings. They managed to have a four hour long debate over the Hungarian child protection law, lecturing Hungary, which unfortunately left no time to discuss minor irrelevant questions like the future of EU and Russia relationship. <laughs> this is reality. Instead of focusing on the real strategic issues like competitiveness, energy security, increased defense, defense capabilities, the Brussels bubbles waste vulnerable time and resources on moralizing and lecturing member states on issues that are not even in the competences of EU. This is a standard operation of empires. They are interested in eliminating nation states, smaller communities, and when the crisis hits, ideology is a political weapon they turn to in order to go into the direction of further centralizing of competences. So today it is obvious that the driving ideology of centralization, it became the Vogue ideology in Brussels. If you are on board with it, you are a good European. If not, then you are out of the whole club. And this is something we national conservatives should always stand up against. And as we see the consequences of this kind of transnational ideology is the opposite of what they expect. It's not integration, but disintegration. It is exactly what we are, national conservatives, we are expecting. So what is the, what is the, the core problem or, 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 the, or, or the philosophical problem behind it? I think it's about, everything is about agenda setting. 
It is agenda setting. What the globalist progressive liberals discuss and debate at the European level, what they think EU politics should be about and what they think people across the EU should consider as public matters. For them, the Vogue ideology is on the top of this priority list, for sure. This is the most important uh, agenda problem. The problem with this, to put it simple, is that the civilization can collapse if it is not the community, not the majority, not the common sense, not the basic interest, but the ideological craziness of the elite decide through agenda setting what is important and what is not. What the scientific literature says, what will put something on the top of political agenda? First, the first element is intensity. It means that something causes a serious and difficult problem on group or social level, such as unemployment, um, the standard of living, and so on. The second, the second is perimeter. This means that the great number of people is affected. And the third, lastly, Urgency refers to an immediate answer and solu solution the problem requires. Here, articles give us examples such as oil crisis in the 70s and the pandemics. According to this list, the war economic consequences are textbook examples of what politicians should debate about. It is evident that in this case, of the EU, we are far away of this. Vogue or LGBTQ issues are not like these issues. Liberals talk about something that affects a very small population of Europeans and not about issues that really have to be solved. Even Marx diagnosis about the working class had a basis in reality, it affected a large part of the society, but neo-Marxist gender program affects only very few people. And this is extremely wor worrying because, because, as I said, civilizations and their public agendas are closely related. Just think about Gerald Diamond, who observed that the collapse of the Eastern Island civilization was due to the fact that the religious elite leading the community pushed the agenda of woodcut. As a result, materials essential for surviving disappeared. The situation is the same with the elite in Brussels and in the European Parliament. Their ideological dogmas overwrite reality and threaten the survival of the European continent. There is such a thing, what we, what we can call European interest, but Europeans are not able to represent and defend it. Sad, but it's true. There is a constant ideological witch hunt against the conservative government, but no strategic thinking of defense, protecting the borders, increasing the level of economic competitiveness. This is the point where I have to mention the war and, and the deadly consequences of the war. No question, Russia is an aggressor and Ukraine is a victim. All the credit goes to the brave Ukrainians who are fighting for freedom. But what is happening now the prolongation of the war will force, force Europe down on its knees. Energy prices are skyrocketing because of the sanctions. Ordinary people are suffering in all European countries. They will lose their jobs, there will be social unrest everywhere, and governments will fail. This is everyday reality. Ukraine can win something. Russia can win something. The United States can win something. China can win something. But Europe will definitely lose if there is no peace in short time or energy will be not removed from the sanctions um, regime. Europeans obviously should be able to defend themselves. Um, it should not be done by the United States of America. But then Europe should understand that some new strategy should be um, accepted, and this new strategy should be defended in the international ar arena. This is exactly the type of pragmatic, strategic, interest-based thinking, what we need instead of identifying the 73rd gender. Anyway, congratulations for them. Um, yeah, the reason I gave uh, this title to my speech is because of the obvious parallel between um, 
uh, Brussels and, and Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan. Hobbes published the book in the mid-17th century. His goal was to put an end on the civil and religious wars. He came up with a theory to legitimize absolute monarchy, according to which the sovereign is the only one to have a strength, power, and capability of prevent brutal wars and avoiding the state of war, um, or, or the war of all against all. This is how the EU project started, but just as in the case of the Leviathan, the outcome is questionable. The desire of having a centralized administration on uniformity, homog uh, homogeneous, uh, eliminating uh, the local and the traditional resembles much more than to an empire than an alliance of equal partners united in diversity, as the motto of the EU says. This is something which will be always opposed by the Hungarians and should be opposed by all the national conservative thinkers from all over the world. Even liberal leaders pushing the Vogue agenda must understand if we fail to ditch ideological debates, start addressing the core pragmatic questions, we will push Europe back to the Middle Ages. Soon enough, the question will be not whether we kneel or not during a football or a soccer game, but, but whether we manage to stand up after the years that will for sure bring all of us to our knees. History is back, the specter of haunting the Western civilization. A specter is haunting the Western civilization. Nowadays, the specter of woke. And when there is something strange in the Western work, who are you going to call? The woke busters, right? <laughs> we need woke busters to counter the woke Leviathan. In this, we national conservatives should lead the way. This is our mission, this is our task. So we Hungarians keep saying and keep representing these things in Europe, in Brussels, and everywhere. Imagine how furious and angry the European liberals are when they keep here speeches like this. But I hope that you survived in a much better shape than the liberals. Thank you very much for your attention.